Okay, this is part two today of God and Country. And um, we're going to finish this up in two days. Uh, our, it's, uh, it's decision time here. And I trust that you have already voted. If you have not, after today, you will want to run to the polls. And um, uh, let me just say, as we began last week, uh, I gave you uh, some, uh, uh, I gave you really the truth about truth. Uh, because the truth about truth is this, that God and truth are the same thing. So whatever you say about God, you can say about truth. So when you say that God is one and there is no other, there's nothing to be compared with God, then you automatically know that the same is true for truth, that there's nothing to be con- compared to truth. There's no opinion, whatever. The second thing that we said last week, that it, just as God doesn't change, neither does truth, regardless of the culture, the condition, the circumstances, the age, the era, whatever it is, just uh, it, truth does not change. The, the, the truth that is happening applicable to me, whatever God would say to me, he would have said to somebody 500 years ago, 1,000 years ago, because his truth does not change. And the third thing is, just as God is the answer to every human condition, whatever it is, he is the answer, not things that we think up, but God, he is my answer to, the, to every part of my human condition, as just as he is, so is truth also ultimately of benefit to every part of who I am. So if I will love the truth, embrace the truth, receive the truth, walk in the truth, I'm going to see great benefit in my life. Now, I I began last week, and I promised you that I would finish this up today, and that is this. I began to give you some biblical principles regarding God and country. Is it valid to have God and country even together in the same sentence? So what I uh, began last week to give you were some what I call biblical principles. These are not social, political. uh, These are not uh, secular principles. These are not personal principles. These are biblical principles because the foundation upon which everything that we do, it must be the Word of God. It must be what God says. And so the first principle that I gave you last week was we called the biblical, uh, the biblical pattern of creation. That God, when he established creation, he did it in such a way that it would shape our worldview. We would get our worldview from creation itself. And so God gave us all these pairs in creation. He gave us light and darkness. He gave us morning and evening, day and night, uh, 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 life and death and good and evil. All of these things come in pairs. And depending on which side of the pair you walk on will determine how your life was going to be. And so we, we took a look at a couple of those and talked a, a little bit about the culture of death last week and what are the manifestations of the culture of death in a society. What does it look like? And secondly, also uh, the nature of evil and uh, evil. And by the way, uh, uh, when, when we said uh, last week that truth doesn't change and it doesn't evolve, I want you to understand this is what happens. Either truth, truth makes me more like God. Deception makes God more like me. Okay? Don't ever forget that. We have in our culture today a reshaping of who God is. And God is becoming more and more like us instead of us becoming more and more like Him. Truth will always make me more like God. Deception and error always make God more like me. So, we have first the biblical pattern of creation, and that is on the, on the YouTube and on the website. You can catch that. The second one uh, is we, uh, we called the biblical philosophy of citizenship, and that is this, that our citizenship is ultimately in heaven. My first and foremost allegiance is to God. It, 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 is, it, is, it is not to uh, uh, something natural or ugly. It is to God. I have an allegiance, and so I, uh, I walk under the framework and under the context of an allegiance uh, to God. And so I then do not, uh, I am not bound by uh, the uh, political persuasions of my family uh, or my state or uh, the region, or uh, the union that, I rep- or the, that I'm part of, or any sort of family traditions, or the neighbor's yard sign. Those are not the things that drive me as a citizen. Right. I mean, if you drive around and you see this, you see this yard sign everywhere, well, the reason why is those yard signs are free. Uh, but anyway, I'm not moved by yard signs. Because I'm a citizen of heaven, and because I'm a citizen of heaven, I, 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 I am not ultimately moved by the person that is running. Uh, I'm not moved by the party or any of that. I am, first I look at the platform. What are they standing on? Because ultimately, the platform is greater than the party or the person. Now, I want you to consider a couple of things. Every party has its own platform. 
And if you want to really know what a, what a party represents, you have to not listen to them. You have to read their platform. Right? If you want to know what uh, the foundation of our country, you need to read the Constitution. Don't listen to the people that try to tell you about the Constitution. By the way, I have a great book here that Alan gave me that I would highly recommend uh, that you might want to check into. It's called Uncomplicating the Constitution. And it's by Chad Kent, and it is an excellent little book. I was going to give it back to him, but I think I'm going to hang on to it for a little while longer. Excellent book. Uh, uh, so uh, if, you, if you want to know uh, what a party rep is represented by, it's by their platform. Now, the second thing is this. Every candidate chooses what platform they're going to stand on. They, they freely choose that. This is not something that they're forced to do. So if I stand on a particular platform, it's because I choose to do so. So if a candidate says to me, but I don't believe that, even though I'm standing on that platform, I say, well, then why are you standing on that platform? Why would you stand on a platform about something that you do not hold a conviction about? Nobody's worrying. Now, this happened in our city. Uh, at our last election, it happened in our city. This guy was a, a Christian guy, and he was running for an office, but he was standing on a platform that Christians uh, would, choose not to, uh, that would choose not to support, and it, it was tough for him because of that. And, uh, but anyway, so you have this uh, biblical philosophy of citizenship, ultimately. So uh, when I look at a platform, I say, uh, the, the idea is not, do I like this platform? The idea is, which of these platforms best represents the heart of God, the will of God, and the ways of God? By the way, no party platform is, is anywhere near ideal or perfect. But what I have to do is I say, which one of all of these best reflects the will of God and the heart of God? And so those are the first two. Now, today I want to give you the last one. And the last one I want to call, believe it or not, the biblical perspective of voting. Pastor Buddy, is there a biblical perspective regarding voting? Yes, there is. Now, I want to take you back to Romans 13.1. Here's what the scripture says. Every person, we read this last week, every person must submit and support the authorities over him. That is the heart of God. Now, here's the last part of that verse that we didn't speak of last week. For there can be no authority in the universe except by God's appointment. Now, that's pretty cut and dried. No authority in the universe except by God's appointment. Which means that every authority that exists has been instituted by God. So, if God institutes every authority and appoints every authority, how does he do that in the United States? What does that look like in the United States? Because there is what God says, this is what I do. But how does he do that in our country? Is it magic? Is it something supernatural? All of a sudden we just wake up one day and we have a leader? No, we elect them. We vote. And the way that God institutes authority in our country is we vote them into that place. So when I am voting, I've had Christians say, well, you know, I'm not I'm really bothered with all this voting stuff because, you know, God's going to have his way anyway. Are you crazy? What did he just say? He said he appoints authorities and puts them in place and works under the system that we have established. They don't fall out of the sky. They come into power and into authority based on voting. So here you and I, as kingdom people, we have a salt and light influence in our nation. That's what we're called to have. We're called to have a salt and light influence in our nation. Now, as a result of this, what we do makes a difference in our nation. Now, our founding fathers understood when we were talking about the nature of evil last week that not only was it the governing bodies that were tainted with evil but also the governed are just as bad we as the governed go astray just like the government does and in in the book uh, alan pointed out to me in the book and it's absolutely true that there are, really are three things uh that men have a tendency toward that make them uh not so good to be governed one, they have a tendency toward greed. And the second one, uh, they uh, are easily corrupted. I mean, you can bribe somebody, you can you know, pay them off or whatever. So the, uh, men are, tend to be easily corrupted. And third, that they move toward self-interest. Now, as a result of this, 
Something is happening in our nation that I want you to uh, consider. And that is, we are moving toward what you would call and what they are calling a culture of envy. Where people are voting according to their own self-interest. Okay? Now, how do we, how should we do that as kingdom people? How should we vote? I'm not talking about who we should vote for. Say, how do we vote? Well, here is, we should vote the same way we live. In other words, we can't live one way and vote another way. The, the mandate upon which we live should be the same mandate upon which we vote. And here's how we live. Do not merely, this is Philippians 2, do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Here it is in a different translation. Abandon every display of selfishness. Possess a greater concern for what matters to others instead of your own interests. Get beyond yourselves and protecting your own interests. Be sincere and secure your neighbor's interests first. Now, if that is true, what is happening is there is a, a growing block of people in our country that realize that if they can vote according to their own self-interest and then they can get stuff by doing that. Now, what that produces is a culture of envy. Now, let me give you a quote by Benjamin Franklin. By the way, we only do this about once every two years. Every time there's a way. Here's a quote by Benjamin Franklin. By the way, Benjamin Franklin did actually say this. Now, there are a lot of quotes floating around the Internet by people that have never said them. Stuff that, that George Washington said this, Abraham Lincoln said that. A lot of the, you can fool all the people all the time. He never said that. Okay, so uh, here is, this is Benjamin Franklin actually said this. When the people find they can vote themselves money, that, that will herald the end of the republic. You see, because the republic was established in such a way that it cannot thrive and survive when it is built and based on self-interest. And so if the, if the electorate always votes what is best for them rather than for the country, it heralds the end of the republic. So what happens is, so what do candidates do? They know this is happening. So what do they do? They put a carrot out on a stick and they just keep making the carrot bigger and better. And the, the people that, are, uh, that follow the carrot don't realize that there's somebody riding on their back. Because this is the analogy, you know, the donkey, you take a stick and you put a carrot on it and you sit on the donkey's back and just hold the carrot out there. Now, you never get to the carrot, but there's so there's somebody riding on the back. So this this whole idea of self-interest is a very, very challenging thing. So what does a culture of envy look like? I want to I want you to be able to see this as it is working in our society. What does a culture because this is coming right out of the scripture? First of all, let me give you a definition for envy. It is a compelling desire to have what belongs to another. That's one definition. That's a very simple definition for envy. Here is another definition. It is the feeling of discontent or resentful longing aroused by someone else's possessions or qualities. A feeling of discontent or resentful longing aroused by someone else's possessions or qualities. So, what does a culture of envy look like and how does it play out in our world? Because this is a growing uh, trend in our nation right now. First of all, it looks like this. A sense of entitlement. I deserve this. I'm owed this. This is something that I should have. Uh, it's not right that I don't have it. And so I'm entitled to this. I'm entitled to that. I should get this. The government should do this for me, should do that. A sense of entitlement. Now, you and I know that in the kingdom of God, there is no place for entitlement. Um, that's not the way it works. The second one is a demand for fairness. Uh, in our world today, there is a cry for fairness. Now, the interesting thing about it is uh, fairness is not a kingdom concept. Uh, because creation is not established on fairness, it's established on God's righteousness and His rightness. So in Matthew chapter 20, when the owner uh, of the vineyard sends the people out to work in his vineyard, what does he say to them? He says, whatever is right, I will give you. He didn't say whatever was fair. Now, they were thinking about fairness because when they came back, they thought they deserved more because they had worked longer. So they're operating uh, from a culture of envy uh, on, based on a demand for fairness. Uh, but in our world today, there is a cry for fairness. Everything has to be fair. And um, uh, that is not the system 
the, uh, the, the created system that we're in. There is a tremendous amount of unfairness in the system and in the creation that God has done. And, uh, and it all works for his purposes because God is ultimately not interested in fairness but in, in building on righteousness and rightness. Now, the third one is this. Uh, what we call a zero-sum bias. That's a, it sounds like a big thing, but it's not. It just means when one gains, another loses. So if you believe, uh, if you believe that the only way that you can get ahead is by somebody else not having as much as you do, you have a zero-sum bias. In other words, the only way that I can ever have more, enjoy more, is for the people who have more than I do to have less than they do now so that I can have more. So the reason why that guy is rich is, and the reason I'm poor is because he has all the money and I don't have any of it. Now, that is called a zero-sum bias. Now, un uh, thankfully, uh, zero-sum uh, bias is not part of the kingdom because in the kingdom of God, you can prosper and I can prosper at the same time. You do not have to fail in order for me to prosper. In other words, God does not have to curse you to bless me. And so, in a zero-sum bias, everything has to be, uh, uh, has to be uh, seen from the light of, well, the only reason I don't have is because they do have. Now, you, you, you can tell where that's going, because when you take that out to its uh, extremities, you get all kinds of interesting things. And the, third one is, uh, the fourth one is a demand for equality. There is a, an increasing demand for equality, a, equality of income, equality of outcome, equality of opportunity, uh, equality of this and equality of that. Now, uh, what's interesting about this is that there are tremendous inequalities in the kingdom of God. Matthew 25, he gave one five, he gave one two, and he gave one one. That's inequality. But God did that. And because, here's the thing, there is inequality in gifting, there's inequality in calling, there's inequality in ministry, there's inequality in assignment, there's inequality in experience. No one has an equal to somebody else in the kingdom of God. There is there is inequality in the sense that the experiences are not the same. And so where the, 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 the view is that the only way to, if you have a zero-sum bias, the only way to bring everything into in even order is to reduce everything so that there is pure equality in everything, uh, which we know doesn't work at all. So, uh, a demand for equality. Now, so if you have a demand for equality, then, then you have to have a redistribution uh, of, of everything so that everybody has uh, uh, what they're going. Now, what's interesting is, do you remember the guy, he, he got five and, and he got five more. And the other guy had two and he got two more, right? And then the one guy had one, but he didn't get any more. And so when, when Jesus says, when the master comes back, what does he set, tell to the people? He says, take the one. This is uh, Luke, um, Luke something, Luke 20, uh, 15 or something. He says, take the guys, the one that the guy has and give it to the one who has ten. And, and in the scripture, and in the scripture, there is a parenthetical statement where the people say, but master, he already has ten. Culture of envy. A demand for equality. And then truth is a first casualty. Truth is always the first casualty in a culture of envy. Why? Because envy kills. Envy ultimately kills. The envy of Cain killed Abel. The envy of Ahab killed Naboth. The envy of the chief priests killed Jesus. That's what envy does. It kills. And it's interesting uh, to, to see how envy killed Jesus. How did they, because Jesus is truth. How did envy kill truth? Well, they did it this way. They did it with a mob. Anytime you have mobs, you have envy. Mobs are a manifestation of envy. We have mobs in our country right now. It is being birthed out of a culture of envy. It was a mob that delivered Jesus. Secondly, the voices of people prevailed over the truth. 
Pilate says, what do you want me to do with him? And the people yelled out, crucify him, crucify him. And the Bible says, and their voices prevailed. So the voices of people prevail over truth. And thirdly, he was discredited and displayed between two actual criminals. So you hang truth between that which is rejected by society. You hang it among the criminals. And when you do, it no longer looks like truth. And so people walk by and they do what? They rail against it as it's hanging there on the cross. A culture of envy. Now, you and I, as kingdom citizens, we are called not to walk according to self-interest. We are called to walk according to kingdom interest and to the interests of others. You see, the more maturity I have in life, the more I'm going to see and notice other people rather than myself. Immaturity is a very self-inward focused perspective. Maturity, working out in the kingdom and working out in the body, I have an interest and an awareness of other people. And so as a voter in the United States, I vote not according to self-interest, but I vote according to the interests of my country. What is the best thing for the country? Because the best thing for me may not be the best thing for my nation. You say, Pastor Buddy, how could that be? Well, I could vote in such a way so that I could get more free stuff. But that might not be, and it's probably not going to be in the best interest of my nation. So there can be blocks of people or even individuals who, if they vote according to their own self-interest, will not be aiding the benefit of the nation. And so there are three, literally three, what they call inalienable rights that help me to see how I ought to vote. Their life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Those are the things that are established that help me to see how I vote. And I want to take those backwards today and just hit them very quickly as they relate to me as a voter. By the way, uh, I, I would say to you, I've never been involved in a church ever where I received any instruction whatsoever concerning any of this. Now, there's several reasons for that, which we'll probably mention in a minute. The first one, let's take the pursuit of happiness. Consider right now what is happening in our nation. We have more people working now than we have in the past 50 years. We do. There are more people employed now than there have been in the last 50 years in our nation. And what that means is we have less people unemployed. And we also have less people underemployed. That's not a political statement. That's a fact. That is a national fact. Now, as a result of that, an amazing thing is happening. And one of those things that's happening is this. Because we have more people working, we have less people not working. And we have less people taking government assistance. That is not a commentary on government assistance. People from time to time need assistance. Now, whether they ought to get it from the government is another thing. I think the church has dropped the ball. God's intention was we would be delight to the world. We were to be the ones that show the generosity of God, not the government. Amen. But when less people are not working and less people are receiving, that means that they are now, they have a greater sense of personal prosperity, a greater sense of well-being, they have a greater sense of respect and dignity because no one, the way we're built and created, no one wants to take something for free. And so when people are more productive in and of themselves, they have a much greater well-being. When people sit around and they don't work and they can work and they don't work, they spiral downwards. I have been in situations where I did not have a job. And I want to tell you, it is a tough situation. When you go unemployed for a while, you start thinking all kinds of crazy things about how you're no good and how you're not going to make it. And nobody wants to, you know, and you don't have any, and you don't have any, uh, anything to offer or anything. And you just sort of get on this dying response. But when people are personally productive because they are working, which is Genesis 2, because they are working, they have a greater sense of well-being. The general welfare of the nation is being increased. The government is supposed to promote the general welfare. 
They're not supposed to give welfare. They're supposed to promote the general welfare and the well-being that's going on. Now, what is amazing is this. So if that's what is happening in my nation, I can then turn around because of a lot of less regulation. By the way, you won't hear about any of this on the, uh, on the news. Uh, a lot of, there's a lot less regulation, less taxation, less this and this, uh, le- less oversight, all these kind of things, uh, uh, oppressive burdens. All this. You take that off, the things begin to work. Now, as a result of that, I can say to myself, well, heck, they gave everybody a tax cut, but I didn't see any of that. I mean, I'm still in the same job. All these other people have gotten great jobs now. I'm in the same job. So I'm going to vote according to my situation. Instead of looking at the nation and saying, you know what? We have a greater sense of general welfare in our nation than we've had in 50 years. Despite all the divisions. When it comes to economics and things like that, a tremendous, a tremendous thing. And by the way, that's with... Blue collar, white collar, and any skin color. We have more Hispanics, more black people working now than, than, than ever. Percentage, ever. That's a good thing. Because that means they're productive. That means they're, they're doing something that is not only productive for the nation, but it's productive for themselves. And people's dignity rises in situations like that. So, I, that's the way I, that's the way I'm, I, that I have to look at things. Uh, in the pursuit of happiness. So that's the first one. The second one is this. Liberty. In our nation right now, we are enjoying a turn in religious liberty that has happened. In the last 10 years, uh, there has been, over the last 10 years, there's been a real clampdown on uh, people's religious liberty, their faith, their convictions, uh, uh, their religious commitments. And we have seen people uh, who's, uh, who personally and with their small businesses and whatever, they have been, uh, they have been harassed, they've been penalized, they've been demonized, uh, they've been sued, taken to court, um, and, and even imprisoned uh, for holding to conscience, to their faith and conscience, and uh, holding to uh, basic traditional Christian values. And there is a pressure and a force uh, against that. Now, what has happened is, over the last couple of years, we've seen that begin to loosen. And that has begun to shift and turn the other way. And as a result of that, you and I, as voters, we could say this. Well, hey, I can still go to church every Sunday. I mean, that guy up in Colorado, uh, 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 you know, I don't bake cakes. And, you know, I'm not an artist. I'm not a farmer. We've had, we've had people who have been excluded from... Uh, uh, what do you call those uh, things, uh, the, uh, the, the produce things, you know, farmer's markets. They be excluded from uh, farmer's markets because they were Christians. They couldn't sell their tomatoes because they were Christian. Now, if you, all you have to do is go back about 50 or 60 years and read in history, and you'll find this exact same was happening, uh, same kind of thing happening before. So in light of this, what I, if, I, if I move according to self-interest, I think, well, uh, there's no, I'm not having any problems. I can still go to church. I can still worship. I can still pray. I can still share Jesus. But an interesting thing, uh, interesting thing occurs. Because if I vote according to my self-interest and I disregard the turning tide and a support for the turning tide, then ultimately... It's going to reverse back again because the trend is and the, the, the pressure is and the tendency is to clamp down on the secular to clamp down on that which is faith-based. So if that's the case, then if I say, well, that, none of that stuff matters to me because I still go to church every Sunday, then basically what's going to happen is once they go back and get those people, then they're going to come for you. And here is an interesting statement that a man made. This is an actual man, Martin Niemuller. Uh, he lived um, during uh, the, um, uh, the National Socialist uh, agenda uh, in Germany. Uh, he apparently was a fairly young man because he didn't die until 1984. Uh, he actually lived and he was put in a concentration camp for seven years. And I'm assuming that he was liberated in 1945. He was put in a concentration camp for one thing only. He spoke out against uh, the atrocities and, uh, and the, um, the heavy-handedness and the oppression of the National Socialist agenda. agenda. And this is what he said. And he did actually say this. There are several versions of this. 
uh, because he repeated it in several different ways. But here's what he said. First, they came for the socialists, and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. And then they came for the Jews, but I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. And so when I am considering my perspective as a voter, I have to consider what is the best, what is going to be the best to create a climate of liberty in my country for people to be able to worship and be able to function and operate within their conscience and in their convictions as born-again believers. So that's the second one. And the third one is life, the right to life, to breathe, to exist, to live. Um, the culture of death works to snuff out all of the symbols of life. And listen to what the book of Deuteronomy says. You must purge from Israel the guilt of shedding innocent blood so that it may go well with you. Now I want you to consider how powerful this statement is. This is God. God is saying to his nation, to his people, that when you shed innocent blood, it is not just a social issue or a political issue or a women's issue or a, a child issue. Um, it, is, it is more than that. Uh, it has to do with the whole national framework. In other words, he says, if you purge the shedding of innocent blood, and by the way, uh, the culture of death, it advocates a, a killing a, a, as one of the, the characteristics I gave you last week. As a result of that, God says that if you will deal with that, it will change your whole nation. It will go well with you. Now, that's an interesting thing. You must purge from Israel the guilt of shedding innocent blood so, so we well with you. Now, when we consider uh, uh, the, uh, the issue and the, the topic of abortion, uh, it is a strange thing that there are a host of churches and church leaders in our nation who still will not address this or acknowledge this publicly in their churches. And it is a national plague. On top of all of the tragedy of mother and child on top of the violence of the sheer act of the procedure and on top of all of the health ramifications and all of these other things, it is a national plague. It's not a social issue. It is a national plague. And as a result of that, listen to what God says in his word. They shed innocent blood. This is Psalm 106, the blood of their sons and daughters. Well, that's what we do. By sacrificing them to the idols of Canaan, they polluted the land with murder. Now, notice what it says. They did not pollute their hearts. They did not pollute their lives. They did not pollute their houses. It says they polluted the land with murder. And as a result of that, it was affecting the entire nation. It was affecting the land, as it were. Here's a scripture. Uh, the rest of that, this is why the Lord's anger burned against his people, and he abhorred his own special possession. Their enemies crushed them and brought them under their cruel power. Now, God said that, that you open the door for the enemy uh, to devour your land uh, as a result of this in Psalm 106. Here is a scripture in 2 Kings 24. Manasseh had filled in Jerusalem with innocent blood. The Lord would not forgive this. That's a pretty powerful statement. That is a very powerful statement. The Lord would not forgive this. There's another scripture in Isaiah 1. When you lift up your hands in prayer, I will not look. Though you offer many prayers, I will not listen. For your hands are covered with the blood of innocent victim. Now, who do you know that lift up their head and lift up their hands in prayer? Certainly not very many people out there. You think about that. So you see, this is a national issue, but it is also a very individual issue for every single born-again Christian. Some pastors don't want to touch it, but I have to stand before Jesus, and I have to explain to him why I either did or I didn't. This is a national 
plague upon our nation. It is a plague. And so here's what we do. Here's a prophetic thing. I believe that this is the last scripture. I believe this is a prophetic picture of who we are as voters. So as I vote, I then have to look for the place that promotes life. And I'm not going to be fooled by people who say, well, you know, I'm for this and I'm for that. No, you're standing on a platform that promotes death. If you don't promote death, then get off the platform. Here's a scripture, 1 Kings 22. I believe this is really prophetic for every voter. But someone randomly shot an arrow that struck Israel's king between the joints in his armor. Wow. Here's it, here, here it is. Amazing thing. The word random. I want you to see it. It has the idea of integrity with it. In other words, it was a serious responsibility. But it also has the idea of perfection with it. This is a sort of a multifaceted Hebrew word here. It means something done with full strength, full effort, not half-hearted. And then it has this idea, simplicity, not really aiming at anything. Some of the other translations, at a venture, by chance, aimlessly, unknowingly, without taking special aim. This is, a, this is an amazing picture because here's what you have. In closing, here's what you have. You have a soldier who is just one soldier among a whole bunch of soldiers. He might have thought, well, I'm just one guy. What can I do? I'm one guy. Secondly, he has one arrow. He has at least one arrow that he can use. He has one. He may not have a bunch, but he has one. Third, he shoots the arrow. He actually shoots his arrow. Now, when he shoots his arrow, he shoots it sort of aimlessly. And he could say to himself, what is the good But one of the translations says he was standing at a distance. So what is the good of me shooting my arrow? What is the good? What good is my vote anyway? But the last thing is this. When he shot his arrow, it changed the destiny of the nation. That one arrow got in between the armor and changed the direction of his nation. I believe it's a prophetic picture because here's the thing. Here's the key. When he shot his arrow, he shot it in the right direction. If you want to hit something, you have to aim in the right direction. If that's not the right direction, I'm not going to shoot my arrow there. I'm going to shoot what is it going as best I can in the right direction. That which goes to life, that which goes to liberty, and that which goes to the pursuit of happiness. That which honors God, honors the Word, honors the will of God, and honors the heart of God as best can be in this situation. Amen. Amen. Finish with this. Only one time in Israel's history did God ever do this. One time. It was unprecedented, but he did it one time. Only. One time. He took a foreign king who worshipped foreign gods and he appointed and anointed that king to facilitate the restoration of his people. One time. I believe that God has done that for us. 
that he has appointed someone who, whether he knows it or not, (laughs) is helping to bring forth the purposes of God in our nation. I don't care what his name is. I don't care what his party is. All I care is the fact that I believe God has done something unprecedented for us to bring his purposes to pass in this nation. God, that we would be a people, one nation, under God. Again, under God. Again, with his glory and his presence in our land. Father, we thank you today for the privilege of being able of shooting an arrow. And while we may wonder what good is our one arrow, prophetically we see what happens when one man takes his one arrow and shoots it in the right direction. I want to ask you to stand with me. I think a great prayer for us to pray today in closing is simply this. God, turn us in the right direction as a nation. Turn us as a people in the right direction. That would be a God-honoring, God-glorifying, direction that your hands of mercy and grace would be upon our nation thank you for reminding us today God it does matter what we do it does matter And our cry is really God and country. Come, O oh God. May we be those who pick up the call, the charge the assignment, the mission. I want to pray my country in the right direction. I want to prophesy over my country into the right direction. I want to invest in my country that it would go in the right direction. I want to shoot my arrow and support that which honors you, O God. And you're such an awesome, incredible, powerful God. We recognize that you can turn us around as a nation. As we're on our knees, as we're on our feet, as we're thanking you, crying out to you. God, may what you have begun in this nation, let it be finished, let it be completed, let it be fulfilled. Every dream, every desire, every declaration that has been put upon this land 
from your heart. Let it be fulfilled in this place.